Welcome once again. Right now we're at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be reading the whole chapter. It's a short chapter. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. But before we get into chapter 7 verse 1, we got to back up a few verses because you see, don't forget, when Paul actually wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he didn't write it. He didn't divide it into chapters and verses. It was just all one long personal letter to the, you know, the believers in Corinth. And so this is an example of one time where the chapters really shouldn't have been divided like like they were, okay? So chapter 7, verse 1, actually should have been at the end of chapter 6. It makes a whole lot more sense. Let me show you what I mean. Let's start at chapter 6, verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be to you a father. You will be to me sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Go over to chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul's talking about coming out from among them, being separate. You know, when, when God said, be holy as I am holy, when Jesus taught his people to be holy, the word holy means separated, set apart, sanctified. You're not like the rest of the world. You're set apart in the way you live, in the way you think. Obviously, you cannot be set apart in, you know, where you are geographically speaking. However, you are set apart in the way you behave, the way you live, the way you think, the way you believe. And at the end of chapter 6, it goes on to say, don't touch any unclean thing. You see now in chapter 7, verse 1, he says again, having therefore these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Hmm, of flesh and spirit. Isn't that something? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And you know, Baptists won't tell you this, but baptism is really at least partially about cleaning the flesh, about washing yourself, about cleaning the outside, cleaning your physical body, really. It's like a, it's like a bath. It's like a dip, okay? And so, of, of course, it's a lot more than that. But the doctrine of baptism really does include the cleansing of the flesh. You know, John the Baptist is not the first one to perform baptisms. I mean, the whole idea of baptisms comes from the Tanakh. You know, it comes from, you know, the idea that God cleanses the earth. You know, the flood of Noah. You know, going through the Red Sea. You know, Moses and the children of Israel going through the Red Sea. And also, it talks a lot in the Torah about actually washing with water. So that is also in the doctrine of baptism. Paul continues, Open your hearts to us. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I say this not to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and live together. Paul really is very close to the Corinthians. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I overflow with joy in all our affliction. They were afflicted back in those days. Lots of persecution against the Christians. You know, it seems to me that as time passes, that kind of persecution is coming again. For even when we had come into Macedonia, our flesh had no relief, but we were afflicted on every side. Fightings were outside. Fear was inside. Nevertheless, he who comforts the lowly, God, check this out, lowly, not the proud, the lowly, the humble. He who comforts the lowly, God, comforts us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you while he told us of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Reading passages like this, you know, talking about Titus, you know, a character that obviously is long gone, you know, just actually brings us back to perspective. This is not like the book of Isaiah, which is the word of God for you. This is Paul writing a personal letter to the believers in Corinth. 
of course, we can take a lot from this letter, but you know, there are some parts of this letter that really does not apply to us. This is one part. Paul continues, For though I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that my letter made you grieve, though just for a while. Remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul, the apostle of grace, really gave it to the Corinthians that were involved in sin. He said, don't you know that if you do this, 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 or this, or this, or this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he sharply rebuked one man, I mean, to the point where he said, hand this man over to Satan, deliver this man over to Satan. Okay, so Paul really, really nailed it to the floor when it came to sin. Here's like a real pastor. When was the last time when the pastor or the priest of your church actually really nailed sin and said, you know, if you do this and give me a whole long list and said, if you do these things, you will not make it into the kingdom of God. Don't forget, Paul was talking to the church. He was not talking to the world. He was talking to the church. I know a lot of you would say, well, the grace of God, the grace of Jesus covers me. Hey, Paul was talking to the church and he warned the church, listen, here's the list. If you fall in this cat in any of these categories, say goodbye to the kingdom of God. So Paul said, for I see that my letter made you grieve, though just for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were grieved, but that you were grieved to repentance. Hallelujah. For you were grieved in a godly way that you might suffer loss by us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, which brings no regret. It's all about repentance. Everything from Genesis through to Revelation is all about repentance. Jesus' first message was repent. The disciples' first message was repent. In the book of Acts, we see it woven throughout all of the book of Acts. Repent. The last word of Jesus to his church not to the world, not to the unbelievers, but to his church in Revelations chapters two and three was repent, 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 and repent. And he gave grave, grave punishments for those who did not repent, including a lot of stuff that does not sound like salvation to me. So thank God that the Corinthians were grieved to repentance Instead of saying stuff like, well, who are you to judge or judge not? Don't you know what Jesus said? Judge not. I mean, totally taken out of context. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Again, Paul continues the thread of scripture and the ways of the Lord saying that salvation is only come by repentance. Produces repentance to salvation, which brings no regret. Paul didn't say, well, you guys need to say the sinner's prayer again in order to get salvation. He did not say anything of the sort. He didn't say, well, you just got to ask God to forgive you for salvation. No, you need to repent in accordance with all of scripture, with the ways of God that was forever settled in heaven since before the foundation of the world. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, this same thing, that you were grieved in a godly way, what earnest care it worked in you. Yes, what defense, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, and vengeance. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be pure in the matter. So although I wrote to you, I wrote not for his cause that did the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered the wrong, but that your earnest care for us might be revealed in you in the sight of God. Therefore, we have been comforted. In our comfort, we rejoiced the more exceedingly for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him on your behalf, I was not disappointed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so our glorifying also, which I made before Titus, was found to be truth. His affection is more abundantly toward you, while he remembers all of your obedience. How with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice that in everything I am confident concerning you. Seek God while he may be found. 
There is a time coming when you will not have that opportunity. If you seek God with all your heart, I guarantee you, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.